The power of four. That's what we've been talking about. The power of four in the series text is that if you will, research has shown, the organization that bought Barna Research did a study through, through uh, different demographics of people, and what it sh- was showing them was that if someone read their Bible three days or less, is it had very little effect on how they lived. And if someone claimed to be a Christian, it had almost zero effect to how they lived. If someone uh, prayed once a day, it had zero to little effect on how they lived. Now, I thought that was strange. If someone claimed to be a Christian and someone prayed once a day, well, the thing about it is you don't know what they're praying about. You know, a dude can be praying, Lord, give me that woman, 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 Lord, give me that woman. And the Lord's going, hey, why don't you repent and let me hear the prayer of repentance before you start praying for that woman. So, uh, because the last thing you may need is that right now. So, you understand that sometimes we are in our human nature really good at praying for what we want, not necessarily what the Lord wants. So, uh, so I was like, okay. And then claiming to be a Christian. Well, look, we all know people that claim to be something that they don't live it, right? So some people claim to be, I can, there's a lot of things I can claim about myself. It doesn't matter what I claim, it matters who I am. You know, I could, if I stood up here this morning and claimed that I was a professional athlete, then you'd look and go, yeah, okay. You know, it'd be, it'd be like, well, I am, I play a, no, it doesn't matter. I can claim a lot of things, but the proof in how I live and who I am is going to be produced in what you're, go, you're going to see. But if someone were to read their Bible four or more times a week, and even say seven. I think seven is like the goal, right? I said four or more times a week. So minimum of four days a week, you either read or listen to the Word. Here's what it says. It says that you are 228% more likely to share your faith with others. And that's a really big number, 228%. And I was thinking, why would that be? I can tell you why. Because if you're just trying to explain your experience, but you've got no truth to validate what you said you've experienced, it's hard to explain. Case in point. I give my life to Jesus Christ October the 28th, 10.30 in the morning in 1998. And when I left that office, people said to me, they said, hey, dude, you look like you're glowing. Now, I don't think I was glowing. I don't think I had a different, uh, they just, it seemed, they they were saying it just seemed like I was lighter. Not like a weight loss lighter, but just a, a, just like a, a lot of pressure off my life. Well, I was eating up with all kinds of stupid stuff like jealousy, bitterness, and, and all kinds of resentfulness towards people. And, and it's just, I was, I was a mess. I didn't realize I was a mess, but I was because I was a pretty good guy to a lot of people. But that morning that I found Jesus Christ, when I left that office, my life was radically changed forever. And so I walk out of the office, and people are telling me this, and all I can tell them is, man, I had 10,000 pounds lifted off my shoulders. And they're like, dude, what were you doing with 10,000 pounds? That's crazy. If you ever think about some of the silly stuff we say to compare to how we felt, it doesn't really correlate with what natural uh, thought patterns are. Man, I, and, and I would tell them, well, you know, uh, I gave my heart, and you, you need to get, because you, you know, I was going to hell, now you going to hell. And they're like, well, I'm a good person. What do you mean? I'm, I didn't know. So, like, well, why do you believe? So if they would ask me that, I was like, well, because I was messed up, man. I was messed up, and I came to Jesus. It's like, okay. Now, God honored that season of my life, but that was my very beginning point. If that's the only thing I could say for the years following, then that meant that I wasn't getting in his word and given an opportunity to learn that how do you become a Christian anyway? Well, Romans teaches us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and in your heart believe that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved. So I started learning scripture to why. And and I get and I understand that the word also teaches us that salvation is foolishness to those who are perishing. So it's not that I was going to be able to intellectually correspond what they were thinking with the experience, but I need to know why I am. I need to know that I've been restored, that I've been restituted, that my past is wiped away. The word teaches that. And you can only live on an experience so long on the emotions of it because your emotions become challenged, like love. I love her. Well, yeah, I, love is an emotion, and I'm thankful for it. But love is more than an emotion because it is a choice that you make every single day. Love is a choice. Like I, get, like I choose to love April. Now, you're like, well, that's easy to choose to love April. Well, the truth about it is, is she chooses to love me. And you're like, well, that's easy because you're awesome. <laughs> Look, I'm, it's a choice she makes every day. I'm difficult. I am emotional. I, she told me last night, she said, you talk too much. I was like, 
I like to talk. <laughs> like in most relationships, the woman does all the talking, and not me. Nope, I like to talk. I just talk. She's like, you talk for seven minutes straight. I'm like, that was good, wasn't it? Like, what is good? What are you talking about? I mean, I just, and, and I drank like eight of those uh, peach teas with the extra syrup in it. So I was sugared up, y'all. I mean, you give me an energy drink, I can talk for real, like really fast, like micro mini machine. Maybe y'all don't remember those, but that, that guy. So I like to, she chooses to love me. And guess what? Here's the thing. It's for, she has a little bit of crazy. I got a little bit of crazy, but we fall in love with each other's crazy. Because love is a choice. It is not the way I feel. Yeah, in the beginning I felt it, and it's not that I don't feel in love. with it. It's just the fact that even if she angers me, I don't go, that's how I don't love you anymore. Because love is a value word. And that's kind of the, the point of, 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 of a relationship is that I'm past my emotions, I am disciplined because of what his word teaches me. So I grasp the concept of that. 228% more likely to share faith with others. 407%. That's a big number. More likely to memorize scripture. Why? Because it's hard to memorize what you're not putting in. Think about it. I mean, we, I, can, I can sing. There's not many country songs that I don't know. I grew up in the Barbara Mandrell era. Look, I was country when country wasn't cool. I went to more country concerts. I was four years old at Lee Greenwood's concert. I, he did sing a different song than God Bless the USA, just in case you didn't know that. I know who Earl Thomas Conley is. I know people you've never heard of. I know it's why because I, so I and I remember their songs. If it comes on a station, I can usually sing along with it. And I hadn't heard it in years because there's something powerful about what you put in. You can remember it. You can remember. So if we're not putting the word in, it's hard to remember scripture. That's why someone says, "Hey, what does uh, Proverbs nineteen twenty one say?" Uh, it says, uh, "Jesus is awesome." It's like, well, what is it? Well, I mean, I don't know. Let's look. But when you read it, like the only reason I know what Proverbs 19.21 is is because I read it. Now, I don't know verse by verse everything. I haven't memorized the whole word. But there are scriptures that spoke to me in seasons of my life that I'll never forget. They really meant something to me. And all of them mean something to me. But those spoke to a specific moment. And I have a memory with them. And they mean a lot to me. The many are the plans in a man's heart. It's the purpose of the Lord that prevails. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, memorizing that. I'm a new creation. There's just all, they mean something to me. There's, just, it, there's this power of memorizing. And can I tell you that you're less likely to slip up when you've memorized something that's powerful enough to change you. It says, so 407%, which just makes sense, that's easy. But it says also that if you read your Bible four or more times a week, you're less likely to view pornography or be involved in any sexual immorality. Now, why would that be? Because it's hard to put in the word and live out something different. You have this war of conscience of going, I'm trying to be godly, but I don't want to be ungodly. I've told you the story before when I went home when my son and one of my other children got, when they, there's this sibling rivalry, their fight happened, and April called me, and your kids are fighting. You know, it's always my kids when they do something silly, right? And, and so I'm going home, and I kind of do the example, like, come on, let's go. You want to fight somebody? Listen, you know, I say, you can either be worldly or you can be godly, but you can't be both. You can either be worldly or you can be godly, but you can't be both. So if you want to be worldly, let's be worldly. If you want to be godly, let's be godly. Why do people get so messed up in this thing called Christianity? Because they hear people say one thing, and they do something different. They get so wounded. I can tell you why. It's because we're living off of a thing that we experienced maybe as a kid or something that we did in our past, and we're not grounded and rooted in the Word, and we can't really describe what we truly believe. We can tell you how it feels. We just can't tell you where it's found. And it's challenging. And then we feel inadequate to tell anybody else how to find Jesus because we don't know what the Word really says. We just believe it because we're in the good old South. We're in the Bible Belt, right? And, and everybody knows about church and everybody knows about Jesus. But you can't take for granted that people do because they may have a misrepresentation of what the gospel even means. And their perspective is all jacked up. And the Lord wants us to be... Look, do you know that if you read your Bible four or more times a week or listen to it, you're 38%, 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness. Look, loneliness is a real thing, especially in the culture that we live that is so consumed with isolating ourselves with electronic devices that we forget how to have a conversation with people. It's, look, if you don't think that where we are as a society, that the addictions that used to 
butcher us for so long is now being turned to this isolation and pulling away and this false relationships and all. And there's loneliness and depression is going through the roof and suicidal thoughts and, and acting on them. They're going through the roof. Why? Because we are so engaged but disengaged. Truthfully. And we're struggling with loneliness. Nobody else feels the way I feel. Nobody else is going through what I'm going through. I'm the only one that's ever missed it. I'm the only one that's ever met. But if, you are, if you're reading your word, you know that, you are not, that God's not finished with you. That he is faithful to complete what he has begun until he returns. God doesn't make mistakes. And so you understand your identity. And you understand that loneliness may be part of a season, but you're never alone because he'll never leave you or forsake you. It's the power of four. Power of four. So four, we're making a commitment that at least four days a week, if I go, I'm going to do seven, or I'm going to read my Bible morning, noon, and night, seven days a week for the rest. Look, that, that, that's incredible. But for a lot of you, if you do it four times this week or five times this week, it's going to be life-changing. <laughs> and you always expect the emotion of it to be different. Like, let's say you want to do family devotions. We were just on a vacation with another family we're real, real close friends with. We pull them together, and we're going to do a devotion. Look, them kids were not sitting around. I say kids. I mean, the youngest one was eight, but she was probably more in tune with it than the others. The rest of the teenagers were sitting around like, I'm going to play basketball. We're like, do you know what it means? Whenever he, what were they expecting when Jesus came? They're like, I don't know. Tell me so we can go play. They're looking at, like, you think, oh, the preacher's kids and the, and the deacons from another church's kid, they're, they're going to be like, oh, no, like, tell me the word, Father. <laughs> Unleash that truth of his word into my life, sir. So good. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> like, you, they don't, anything that you start to do that you're trying to, it's going to be awkward at first. Just like witnessing's awkward at first. Do you know Jesus? Nope. Would you like to meet him? Jump now, what I say? <laughs> Do you want to meet him? I can't show him to you. What am I even talking about? You know, it's, uh, do you know if you were to die, you would spend the rest of your days in hell? Why? Are you judging me? No. Well, how'd you come up with that? I don't know. I don't know how I just know that. I should know you're going to hell. That's all I want. <sighs> I hadn't read that far yet. You know, it's kind of. It, it's awkward, and, and, but the knowing's in the doing, right? You, you, start, you take the four. What if you led your family devotional what the Lord said to you that day? Might be a little more authentic. Man, I was reading this, and you know what? It says something about self-control, and I was saying, guys, do you think Daddy needs some more self-control? I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, sir, because I should be able to do whatever I want and play video games as long as I want, and you should just be okay with it. Self-control. No. <laughs> Look, but they'd be engaged, and they'd be able to have a conversation, and that's what the goal is. You know, I'm walking through life. Look, life is difficult. I think we can understand that. Life is tough. It's easy to misunderstand. It's easy to pick up a fence. But if we are biblical, when we are in the Word four or more days a week, the likelihood of us walking in an ungodly perspective is, is a lot more slim than before. So my heart is this, as your pastor, is to say, let's, let's be biblically centered. I mean, for real, biblically centered, because we need it. Paul tells to Timothy, chapter 3, he said, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. <laughs> terrible times. Look it up in the Greek. It means bad, y'all. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love. Unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I mean, like, this dude's covering all of it, right? Look, this is written a long time ago. Very re Just as much as he believed they were in the last days, as much as I believe that we're in the last days. He said... Lovers of pleasure and lovers of God, having a form of God, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. Why? Because they are going to drag you into stupidity. you got to know that. Some people just live in constant drama, right? There's always got drama happening. Do you know when the drama stops? When you get sick and tired enough to stop it. The drama that's in my family, I put a halt to it real quick, fast, in a hurry. 
Why? Because that dysfunction is not going to repeat itself. I can go visit home, catch up with the last five years in about seven minutes in the morning time. Then go back the next morning and they'll retell me everything again. And they all know what everybody else should be doing while they ignore doing that themselves. So what I do, I choose not to participate. Now, I engage, I have conversation, but when they say, do you know what so-and-so is doing? I'm like, no, how are you? Yeah, can you believe that they did that with their kid? I can't, hey, what's for breakfast? Why? Because if I can get them focused on what everybody else is doing, we can have a conversation about our life and have a chance for God to do something Cool. Someone's going to always try and drag you into their drama. So for me, I just say, hey, save a drama for your mama. I ain't your mama. Okay? I'm not going to get in that drama fest with you. I'm just not going to do it. Why? Because if I'm focused on what God's calling me to do, I ain't got time to jump in everybody else's business. I want to be focused on what God has. They're going to be have nothing to do with such people because they're going to be pulling you down. Verse 6. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins or are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. I hear what you say and preach. Okay, I'm glad you're here. But are you coming to the knowledge of truth? Because knowledge without application will not give you transformation. Knowledge with application will transform your life. And it will change some of the goofy beliefs that you may be struggling with that are not biblically founded. And then Paul gives a final charge to Timothy. He says, take what you've learned. And I become convinced that you become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. And from infancy, verse 15, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus. All Scripture, all of it, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Look, a lot of people think it's only for rebuking and correcting. But training, training, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you know that Jesus didn't leave you ill-prepared on how to interact with culture? He didn't leave you unwise or with an inability to learn how to live this life as a man or a woman of God. He gave us a standard. He gave us a way. He gave us his word. He said all of it. Paul told Timothy, all of it is God-breathed. All of it is useful. All of it is for training, teaching, rebuking. All of it is for correction. Why? Because it is life-giving. It will change everything about who you are. Everything about who you are. It'll change. Look, I'm thankful for his word. That's why when somebody says, man, preacher, I just need a word. Well, open it up and read it. I need, man, you got a word for me? Yep, I sure do. Some people want you to give them a word so they can be lazy and not have to dig for themselves. Man, I'm going through this. Preacher, what you think? Well, I think what God believes. I believe his word. That's why I love it when people come and say, Pastor, what do you think about uh, this situation with, uh, like, I don't know what the Bible says. Let's look at the Bible. Let's go to the Bible. Because I and my humanity can miss it. I can become emotional and say all kinds of stupid stuff. I'll give you a case in point. I'm a youth pastor in my first position, and I'm preaching on forgiveness. And the altars are flooded with students, and they are, they are, some are crying. But there's this one girl who's welling. Her name's Megan. She's 13 years old, and she is short for real. She's a real short girl. And she's, but she's crying, some kind of big, welling. And I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord. It's so good. She's getting free. And I'm like, man, why is she crying so hard? One person said, she's crying because she's forgiven her dad who's raped her. Well, I can tell you what I felt right then is I felt like the Lord was calling me to go whoop her daddy. Was that what the Lord? No, because the Lord was wanting to set her free so she didn't create a prison for the rest of her life to feel like she was damaged goods and never worth anything. He wanted to set her free. My emotions can get jacked up sometimes. If I'm dealing with a situation, how many of you know as parents, sometimes you can see through the goggles of a parent and not see the whole situation? Get very tunnel vision. Well, not my kid. Well, look, just listen to the story. Then get the evidence and then make a decision. Don't react first. Be patient. Be quiet. Don't open your mouth and give all proof to them thinking you're an idiot. When darkness tries, so listen to me. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good word. You know, Jesus doesn't want to leave you stranded. It's like when darkness comes in, we have the, uh, the opportunity to understand that, man, there are going to be times in life where things get dark. They're going to get dark. 
It's part of it. We're going to feel attacked from every angle. But here's what I love is no matter how dark it gets, we will always have his word as a light. A lamp at our feet and a light for our path, the psalmist says. And what it does is it lights up not just where I'm walking, but it lights up what's around me. I can see the stuff. I see darkness trying to come in. And what does light do? It casts out all darkness. So I want the light. I want the light to guide me. I want the, guide, the, the light to, to direct me. I want the light to... But how do I get... How do I get to carry the light? Because I know it. I read it. I got four more days a week that I'm letting it just come into my system so that I can have a light for my path and a lamp into my feet. It's just a, it's a beautiful opportunity. The Lord wants to light up your world with his word so that you don't have to live in darkness. The Lord doesn't want you to be in a place where you can't see what's happening, what's going on. He wants you to live with a visibility of knowing that he can do anything and everything he wants to do in any moment that you are having. He, he gives us his words. We can be equipped for every good work. So we develop a biblical worldview. That's to gain the right perspective. Listen to me real quick, fast, and in a hurry. Stop responding to cultural issues with what you feel. Get in your word and know what the word says about it. Don't just get out there on your own opinion and say, well, I feel this. Your feelings may not be right. So if you claim to be a Christian, you can't go against what his word teaches. You can't do it. Well, I mean, you can, but you can't be a Christian and go against it. You understand to be a Christ follower means you live as he lived, and you put into practice what his word teaches. That's what being a Christ follower is. But in the world in which we live, it's kind of difficult because... We see a lot of people claim a lot of things, but they don't live in it. And the way that that comes is not being a person who's always standing up and trying to tell everybody how wrong they are. It means that you live your life in such a way that people can't even run their mouth about you because you live above reproach. It means that you are biblically centered in what you do. It's a biblical worldview. All of us have a worldview, but are you going to have a biblical worldview? How do you see the world through which you live through the lens of Scripture? That's why I'm with someone, can you believe they said that about you? Like, yeah, probably. I don't know. Not everybody's going to like me. Guess what? Not everybody loved Jesus, and they crucified him. So as long as they ain't hanging me out in front of the city, I'm doing pretty good. Well, they said this. My own father said something about me, and, and, uh, and my oldest brother called me. He thought I would engage in it and pick a fight with him. And he said, he said you this about you. He said you was fair. He said, I'm like, okay. He said, you ain't going to go over there and do anything about it. Why? Because I don't entangle myself in civilian affairs. I've got a level at which God has called me to live. and It has nothing to do with being a preacher. It has to do with being a Christian. I'm not going to engage on his level and entangle myself and prove what he said to be true. I'll let him run his mouth, and I'll live in a way that honors God, and then he will be the one that looks foolish to everyone he ran his mouth to. Instead of going back and engaging in it and going, I, I knew he wasn't any different. It's like family reunions, right? You get saved, you go back to a family reunion, you're first generation Christian, it's like they all want to pick a fight with you. Oh, come on, Johnny, you ain't really a Christian for real. I mean, you still laugh, don't you? Yeah, I still laugh. <laughs> you know, you drink a Coca-Cola and burp. I knew it. Yeah, I knew you wasn't a Christian. Like, I think belching's not sin. I, mean, I don't think it. I mean, it could be disrespectful in some settings, but some cultures, it's honor to the food. I don't know, it's... They'll look for any biblically centered because you want to have a you want to go through the lens of a biblical worldview. Listen to me. When the enemy wants us to be crippled, he takes away our weapons. When you look back through the Old Testament, what would happen with the children of Israel? They'd go into captivity. What would they do? They would take away their ability to fight. And so the enemy wants to take away our ability to learn the word. So what he would love to do is create religious structures where you never engage in the word. You just listen to a mouth on a platform. I'm thankful for church, and I'm thankful for pastors. I'm thankful for biblical pastors that preach the Word of God. I don't know about entertainers that make you feel good, because if you read on in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there's a whole lot of tickling ears that happen, and they preach what feels good instead of what truth is. Can I tell you that I believe truth can feel good too? I believe when the truth of God's Word is preached, it doesn't leave us feeling like we can't make it. It leaves us going, all right, God wants to do a work in me. Like, I'm always encouraged when his word challenges me. You need to work on that. I'm like, man, I don't go, that's it, God. I'm never going to be good enough. I'm like, Lord, I'm so thankful you love me enough. 
that you're going to speak to me and help me see the error of my ways. Because I may not respond as well if somebody's coming to me like, I just want to tell you what you're doing wrong. When I first became a Christian, my pastor had ever called me in his office and said, Johnny, here's what you can and can't do. I just fell in love with Jesus, opened his word, and, and it's crazy that his word dealt with my life. I've never, ever, ever to this day had a preacher call me in his office and tell me how to live. Now, I'm not saying that they couldn't have. I'm just saying that I don't want to leave it up to somebody else to call me because I really believe when the Lord saved me, he called me to live for him, and I want to honor him with my life. Now, that doesn't mean I do everything right, but whenever I mess up, the Lord convicts me, then I have a decision. Well, I'm going to have to make that right. Have I ever upset anyone? No, oh, probably I'm married. You know what I'm saying? Have I ever mistreated my kids? Probably so. They're not in here to defend it. Maybe their mother has. It's one of those things that you just get, like, I don't, I don't want to, I, I know what it's like, y'all, to be in a church where, you know, only Southern Gospel is going to be in heaven and and if you had a TV, it was a one-eyed devil was telling the wall. And you can't, no, no, it's just, it's legalism. And Jesus didn't die so he'd be legalistic. There's nothing wrong with personal legalism standards you set for yourself. But just because, just because you don't eat meat doesn't mean nobody else can. Matthew chapter 15 is what Jesus is telling them. Matthew chapter 15, the Pharisees are making it about, so your disciples aren't washing their hands. He says, it's not what comes from the outside of a man. It defines what comes out of him. It makes him unclean. Well, some people will take that scripture and say, well, it doesn't matter how I live, what I watch, or what I do, because it's not on the outside that it affects me. Well, he's talking about a tradition that they have of washing their hands so they'll be ceremonially clean when they eat. And he's saying, look, you are clean on the outside, but on the inside, you are dirty, nasty, rotten, filthy people. That's what he's telling them. He's given them this, this, this paraphrase breakdown and this teaching where, he, where his disciples say, look, you've offended the Pharisees. He's like, because they're whitewashed tombs. They're so nasty on the inside. They don't have a godly perspective. They do what they do for their prestige and their opportunity and their platform. They don't do what they do because they genuinely love God and love people. It's what goes into their system when they eat, and then what comes out that defiles them makes them unclean. So the enemy wants to cripple us so that we don't have the weapons to fight or the ability to sharpen them. When you have limited ability to defend yourself when attack comes, why? Because we're not reading four more days a week. You could be amazed that God can speak to you through his word in a situation right where you are. Or you may have read something three weeks ago that's going to deal with something you're going to walk through next month. And you're going to look and say, man, his word to me. His word to me. His word to me. It's incredible to be able to say his word to me says. But what, wants, what he wants to do, the enemy is he wants you to choose the path of least resistance. Like, if you're not reading, well, I heard what the preacher said, but you know, I'm better than so-and-so, I'm better than that dude. Well, that dude was never the standard. Think about when it comes to parenting. You know, back when you in the day would say, uh, I tell you what, whenever I have a kid, they'll never cry in a restaurant like that. Well, you don't get to make that claim until you have one. And then take them to the restaurant when they've not had a nap. And the food takes 45 minutes to get there. I know what chaos is in a restaurant. And April and I never said it out loud. We said, oh, you let our kid act like that. It's going to get real. Look, I, so I'm, I'm taking this evangelist to E. He's doing a revival at our church. And he's, he's from uh, Mississippi. And his kids are in there eating. And his kids were just, they weren't even being rowdy. They were just like playing with each other in the booth. And he reached over and boom, backhands them in the face. I'm like, huh. Like, the whole restaurant just kind of stops and looks over. It's like, you sit right down there in that seat, boy, you hear me? Now, I'm not doing that because I'm trying to say he was like a, a goofy hick. I, that's the way he talked. And, like, I didn't even know what to say. I was like, uh, he said, cowboy, no, it's not football season. Uh, man, that's a, who is, let me say, you may think I'm a little hard. He goes into this kind of spiel, and he basically ends up saying this. He said, you know why I stand for the Lord? You know, his word says, he who spares the rod hates his son. I don't say spoils the child, says hates his son. And I'd rather stand before God, Brother Johnny, and have God say to me. As if we say it with authority makes our lack of self-control any better, right? Have the Lord say to me. Hey, because you're too soft on them kids, they burning in hell. 
But I'd rather have the Lord say to me, because you was tough on them boys, you may have been a little tough, but because you were, they in heaven with me. And I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I still don't think the Lord wants you to slap your kids stupid like that. Do you know how many times people have a perspective they think they're right? Like a man who wants to beat his wife? Like a man or a woman who wants to justify their racism? Or a person who wants to justify kind of their stance in life because of the way they were treated? We're going to have a biblical perspective. We can't. Look, we got a whole lot of rights we can hang on to. But we can die to ourselves and let Jesus live through us. Become a new creation. His word at work in our life. God wants to use you, and he wants his word to be the example in your life to change everything about you. Not comparing to other people. Not comparing to that. So you kind of think about it kind of a filter illustration. April, bring me the, I'll tell you what, Kevin, bring me the um, picture in the, do not spill it because we have no more of that. That is you can spill this one, just not this one. Now, this is grade A, pure, freshly collected bay water. It's a little cleaner than I thought it was going to be. Years ago, I did this stupid thing called the Grand Man. And all the way up to the Grand Man, you couldn't swim in the water because it was unsafe. You'd get a disease or lose a leg or something. I don't know. It was like, it was like something crazy. And I'm thinking, okay, but... The, Ironically enough, it was red the day before, but it rained, which usually makes it worse, right? It's all the septic going into it. But the morning of the swim, it was green. Like you just, like the water was green. No, the, the light was green for you to be able to swim in it. So I with my mouth closed that day. Make sure no open cuts on me. Bay water, the risk of it. And then you got people like, man, I've been swimming that bay all my life, man. I drank more of that bay water. Ain't nothing ever going to get me, man. I get up in that bay. Okay, get sick one time, almost die. You have changed your perspective. You might have had enough grace tonight. <laughs> take one time. And what I've learned is this, is that you can take something that is, they've said is not safe. I mean, look, when somebody runs out of water at their office in those Kentwood jugs, they don't go down to the bay and refill it and go, that's good, it's got a filter. You pour it in here. And you start seeing it coming like, oh, yeah, okay. I mean, it was a little yellow, but now it's... Let me tell you how the process works. In the right filter situation, you pour this back out, pour it back in, pour it back out on the right, to the right, not saying that this is. It's kind of like what the Lord does with His Word. He filters out the things that don't belong. And when you pour it back out and put it back through the filter, guess what happens? He takes out the things that don't belong. He filters through His Word. And you don't have to guess at it. He's giving us a standard. This water comes in, you're like, ah, oh, still a little cloudy. You know, I was going to put the challenge out there. Who wants to just drink this whole thing for $10? But there's always one. I'll drink it. And then be like, I'll drink it for four. I'll drink it for three. I'll drink it just to drink it. You know, it's a, so we didn't do it. Because there are some people that don't care how it affects them. They think they're bulletproof. They can do whatever they want. And the truth about it is, is there's a standard that's been given us. Listen to me. Our filter shapes our virtues. Do you know our virtue? A virtue is a behavior that you hold close to, that you see as important, you deem as a big deal. The most important virtue during the life of Jesus was justice. They're always trying to bring justice. Today's most important virtue is tolerance. That's why 2 Timothy goes on to say in chapter 4, there will be a day when men won't put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they'll suit their own desires, gather around them a great number of teachers. Not pure people, teachers. Do you understand? There are preachers that preach all kinds of stuff. Get in a Bible-preaching church, Christ-centered church, and get your roots down solid and test everything that is preached. Why? So that you don't get deceived. They preach to itching ears and what they want to hear. They turn away the truth and go on to miss. They go on to miss. I, well, I'm not a bad person. Look, if you don't know Jesus, you're a terrible person, no matter how good you think you are. 
Now, I'm not saying, oh, you're terrible because I think. I'm saying that there is no one righteous, not even one. Why? Because the Word teaches that without Him, there is no achievement of a life with Christ unless you surrender yours to His will and His way. That's what it says. I'm not a bad person. I'm, I'm sure you're not in your own mind. Well, you have no right to tell me how to live. That's why I'm not telling you. You understand, I'm not up here today trying to say, you know what's wrong with you? Look, I believe you're here because there's something right in you. I believe you're watching today because there's something right in you that the Lord wants to work in. And it doesn't take a, a genius to spot a problem. we got to see what's right and let God build from there. I believe the Lord wants to work in and on you through His Word, through the thing that is right in you. None of us have a good response wherever somebody's always telling us what's wrong with us. We're like, okay, all right, good. I'm, I'm terrible. I get it. But whenever he speaks to us through his word, when it comes to self-control, like, you got no right to tell me, who are you? We start saying, you know, I, I can justify anything I want to do. I can justify anything I want to do. I'll tell you a short story, and then we'll close. I'm going to Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. There are uh, two big Bible schools there in that town. And it was three, three big Bible colleges there in the town. And I was working at the golf course, and one of the guys that hired me uh, was a preacher's son from the East Coast in Assembly of God Church. And, and this guy was living all kinds of crazy. He kind of got away from home and started living all kinds of goofed off. And, and uh, he hired me, and uh, through a season, kind of built relationship and stuff like that. And I always kind of try to maintain a high lifestyle. Uh, not to try and be someone I wasn't, but try to be an inspiration to them because he had hired so many of these Bible college kids through these schools to come in and they live as bad or worse. You know, they're, they're getting drunk, sleeping around, they're, they're, uh, they're skipping chapel, not going to church, they're signing a the card saying they did so they get the grade for it. You know, the kind of preachers you want to look forward to leading your congregations, right? And we're having a, a challenge inside the golf shop with... Uh, so I'm playing golf for free most every day. Then I'd work, and I'd go in before work, play real quick, and, and uh, come back in and work. And, and so we're having this deal like King of the Pro Shop where we would play uh, each other. So he's one of the assistant pros, and we're playing. And the night before, I had went and rented a movie at Blockbuster. I'm kind of dating myself. For those of you who don't know, there used to be a store you would go to, and you would pay a price. And if you didn't turn it back in on time, they would charge you a lot of money. And so, uh, and, and then you didn't just own it and think because it would show up on your collections. A friend told me about it. So there's... Uh, you used to go and rent uh, movies. It wasn't as accessible and easy. But what had happened is I'd come home on a Sunday night, and I was watching TBS, and Tin Cup was on. And, I, and he got the shanks. Now, I like to golf, so whenever he got the shanks, you know, everything was edited out. And I was like, oh, that's funny, that's funny, that's good. So I was like, man, I want to watch the whole thing. So I went and rented it at Blockbuster. I come back to the house. I'm watching it and, it, and he gets the shanks. And the words that came out of his mouth, I'm like, oh, it ain't going to affect me. That ain't going to affect me. Now, I hadn't said a cuss word since February 3rd of 1999. And so I'm like, oh, I'm a preacher. I'm traveling preacher. It ain't going to affect me. It ain't going to mess with me. It ain't going to mess me up. I'm not going to do anything stupid. Well, look, I said all that to myself. Watched the whole movie. And I go in the next morning. And, and uh, I go to school. Go to chapel. All that stuff. I'm playing after chapel, uh, after school. Uh, around with this guy on the third hole. I'm up the first two holes. And I get to the third hole. And I'm really kind of want to win. I want to beat this guy because I think it would be funny to trash talk him. And um, I don't know if that was biblical, but it felt good. And I'm on the tee and I duck hook my drive OB and when I did I took my club over my head and I slammed it on the ground and I thought I said the mother of all bad words I mean I thought it was so and I was like oh I froze up I was like oh oh what uh wow I didn't say anything I get back in the car I hit another ball and play and we get back in the car and Tim says to me is you know Johnny he said Man, I got a lot of respect for you he said I've hired a lot of guys from Bible college here and all of them come in and they don't live it. He said, but you've lived everything that you said you believe. And dude, I respect that. So let me tell you something. You can't pour whatever you want to in your life thinking that it won't come out. Because I can promise you, slamming my club and cussing was not my goal. Now, I didn't that day, but it was really close. But well, if you thought it, you may as well have said it. No, that's not true. Well, if you think somebody, what we allow in will determine what will come out. Filter. Be filtered through His Word. Watch what you do. Say, God, I only what, want what you want for me. Stand with me. We're going to close. We're going to pray and we're going to get out of here.
Everything filtered through God's Word because God's Word brings power, healing, direction, and freedom. His Word, His Word holds the key. So maybe today I want to help you to know that choose a Bible. Well, what, what version? Might be NIV, NLT, uh, King James, if that's what you want to do, the New King, it doesn't matter. Pick a version and read it. Four more days a week. Like, do I need a study Bible? You can get a study Bible. You can get a U version. Read the who, the when, and the why. What was God trying to say? U version has so many apps. So there's an app that we're going to do this week called Whisper, Hearing God's Voice. Go to U version, create an account, and it's free. Go to plans, type in Whisper. If you want to go on Facebook, Jason will have the link up to it. You just go to U version and download Whisper, How to Hear the Voice of God's five day reading plan. I promise you, it would be better for all of us to be able to hear the voice of God. Just tools for studying, and then let it empower you. Let it empower you. We know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commands. It's what 1 John 2, 3 and 6 says. Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Today, I believe with all my heart, is an opportunity for us to be able to live as Jesus lived with a heart towards God to say, not my will, but your will be done. God wants to speak to you today. God wants to speak to you through his word. He wants to give you an opportunity to hear his voice. God desires to be in relationship with his children, worship through his word. And today, maybe you're out there and you say, I I don't even know if I believe in Jesus, but today's your day to get saved. So today, right where you're standing, All you have to do to be saved is confess Jesus as Lord with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You can be saved. Now, let the filter of his word change your life. And maybe today you're walking through a situation, maybe salvation is not the issue for you, but you're walking through a situation you don't know quite how to handle it and you've got this skewed version of what you think, man, and you've, you've been trying to twist lifestyle and different things to match what you feel instead of taking His Word and saying, what does it really say? Today the Lord wants to say to you, I've given you the standard. I want you to be free. I want you to be healed and I want you to be whole. He is our cornerstone. He is the one who gives us every opportunity to live in truth and hope and righteousness. So today, right where you're standing, my prayer leaders that are here are gonna come and find a spot in the front. They're gonna be available to pray. If you want prayer for sickness or you got a financial, or you got any need or you want someone to pray the prayer of salvation with you, then you can come and we wanna pray with you. We're available for you. But maybe today, just where you are, there's gonna be this noticeable thing for you to say, I'm gonna live in the surrender and the filter of his word. God, speak to me through your word so that I'll be the man or the woman of God that you've called me to be. Because he wants to build your life.